Hello and welcome to this lecture where we will be talking about the tools and techniques that are used for detection of radio waves from the universe, basically the area of what we call radio astronomy. And uh, uh, I am Yashwant Gupta. I work at the National Center for Radio Astrophysics at Pune, uh, which is part of the TIFR. And uh, we are involved in research in radio astronomy. And uh, I'll talk more about that as we go along. So I have split today's presentation into four parts, uh, as you can see here, uh, starting with the introduction to radio astronomy, telling you how it ties in with the other branches of astronomy and how it started, and moving on from there to talk about uh, some of the basics of uh, radio astronomy, how radio telescopes are built, how they function, how we use them, and moving on from there to illustrate some of these ideas by doing a case study of our own uh, giant meter wave radio telescope. And lastly, ending up with talking a little bit about what are the future prospects today for radio astronomy. So let's start with the, the first part, which is a very basic introduction, uh, some of which uh, you would definitely be aware of, but we will see how it ties in to radio astronomy. So as we all know, astronomy is the oldest science. It started from the time when mankind turned its gaze up to the heavens and wondered what is up there. And uh, it started obviously with the naked eyes uh, because that is the natural detector for light waves. And as we see, this is important uh, that you have to have the right kind of detector for uh, different electromagnetic waves. Um, but then when the telescope was invented, uh, there was a dramatic change in the way we could do astronomy. And as we all know, the man who made this happen was Galileo, who turned the telescope to the heavens for the first time in early 1600s. And uh, uh, the rest is history, as we know that uh, uh, we completely changed the way we see and understand the universe. But it is interesting to see how the optical telescopes evolved from the time of Galileo. So here you can see uh, the evolution of the basic telescopes from the time of Galileo's uh, small uh, telescope all the way to the modern ones, uh, which as you can see are very large structures um, with very specialized instruments. The basic message that I want to convey here is that bigger is better. Uh, and the important question to ask is why is bigger better as far as telescopes is concerned? And there are two main reasons. One is that a bigger telescope collects more light, as you can very easily imagine. And when you collect more light, you are more sensitive. And therefore, you can see fainter uh, sources more easily. And uh, this is kind of the reason why when we go into a dark room, uh, our eyes dilate so that uh, you can open the pupil wider and collect more signal because you are in a dim light condition. In addition to the better sensitivity that a bigger telescope provides, uh, one very important factor is what we call magnification, uh, which is uh, the bigger telescope allows you uh, higher resolution, uh, which means that you can distinguish between nearby objects um, or sources in the sky uh, much better. And therefore, you can see more details of objects. So this is very important. And it's important to realize that both the sensitivity and the resolution of a telescope uh, depend on the size of the aperture. Uh, the sensitivity uh, goes as the square of the aperture because the area is what is important for deciding how much light you're collecting. And the resolution goes inversely as the size of the aperture and the wavelength. So for a given wavelength, the larger you make the size of the telescope, the better is the resolution. Uh, that means uh, it's a smaller value. That means you can resolve objects closer by in the sky. For a given aperture, of course, if you are working at a larger wavelength, then the resolution goes down. And this is what we will see uh, will be of importance when we go uh, to radio astronomy. So these uh, have been the two main factors driving the growth 
of large telescopes and uh, we can uh, illustrate this with simple examples. So, this is an example bringing out the ability of the resolution. So, improved resolution. So, you can see the moon here uh, in four different um, uh, views taken with telescopes of different size from the simplest one where you can just barely make out dark patches on the surface to this final one here where you can see very clearly details of craters and uh, many other structures on the surface of the moon. So, this clearly illustrates the power of having a better resolution. And uh, you can see a combination of both resolution and sensitivity by taking the case of a well-known object, the Andromeda galaxy, which many of you uh, may have seen even with the naked eye uh, on dark sky located over here in the constellation of Andromeda. If you look at this with simple Galileo type telescope, you see this simple fuzzy object in the sky and with the more modern telescopes, you see an object like this where not only uh, can you see much fainter objects, uh, very faint stars and other um, uh, clouds and objects are clearly visible, but you can also resolve uh, much more detail than you can with a very simple telescope. So, that's just to bring home the point about the importance of the size of the telescope. Now, let's go beyond light waves, which is how astronomy started and ask this question that finally, light is a form of electromagnetic radiation. As we know, it's part of a much wider spectrum of waves ranging from the lowest frequency or the larger wave, largest wavelengths, which are the radio waves from there to the highest frequency or the smallest wavelength, which are gamma rays. And uh, this picture illustrates that, uh, where you can see uh, the changing frequency over the electromagnetic spectrum going from radio waves to gamma rays. And uh, uh, the kind of sizes that they match to uh, and uh, the corresponding frequency. And uh, the important question then one can ask uh, knowing that you know light is just one small part of this large electromagnetic spectrum is that can the same object in the universe emit at different wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum and therefore can it be studied at different wavelengths and as we will see the answer is yes. The other interesting question of course is that do the different wavelengths give us different information about the object and there again the answer is yes and that is very important. And uh, the third one is that are there objects or phenomena that can be studied only at some wavelengths, for example, something that may not emit at any wavelength other than optical or any wavelength other than radio. And again, uh, the answer is yes, there are objects in the universe which preferentially emit only on a narrow part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And therefore, if you are able to study objects in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, then you can get a much more detailed and complete view of the universe. And uh, this is illustrated by uh, this uh, simple picture back to our favorite, the Andromeda galaxy. And this is the Andromeda galaxy seen uh, in different wavelengths uh, going all the way from x-rays uh, to very low frequency radio waves. And what you can see is that the object does not look the same at different wavelengths. There are different parts of the galaxy which become more prominent at different wavelengths and uh, therefore, uh, it tells us again that you can get complementary information about the object by studying it at different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. So, that brings us to this topic of multi-wavelength astronomy that uh, clearly there is a lot to be gained by doing astronomy at multi, multiple wavelengths. The question is how easy is that to do and that is where we come up against uh, the couple of hurdles. The first as we would have noticed when you started with optical astronomy is that you need the detectors. Our eyes have the natural detectors for detecting optical wavelengths, but you do not have natural detectors for detecting other wavelengths. And so, therefore, this had to wait for technology to develop with time, whereby detectors for different wavelengths could be discovered, built and then utilized. And so, we all know about photographic plates, which are now used for optical astronomy, charge coupled devices, radio communication equipment is the one that led to the ability to detect radio waves and we will come to that in a minute. 
Uh, second, uh, which is equally important, is that all of these wavelengths from outer space, from celestial objects in the universe, may not reach us at the surface of the Earth. Uh, and you, you know, we must remember the ozone layer that protects us from harmful UV rays from the sun. So when we look at the picture in full detail, we see that there are only two Earth-based windows. One is, of course, the optical one, as we all know. And if you look at the other one, uh, it is in the radio band. So what this shows is the opacity of uh, the Earth's environment, which is a combination of the atmosphere and the ionosphere of the Earth, to uh, the wavelengths uh, uh, over the electromagnetic spectrum. And 100% opacity means that particular wavelength is completely blocked from reaching. And a 0% opacity is the situation where you would get that signal on the surface of the Earth. And so it's clear that uh, the one major window which uh, can be done with Earth-based telescopes is this one here going from a few centimeters or maybe even a bit below if you can put your telescope at, at higher altitudes uh, to a few tens of meters in wavelengths. And that is the radio window. And um, so it's then natural that radio astronomy was the next branch of astronomy to, uh, to take birth after optical astronomy because that was possible to do with Earth-based telescopes. So the question then remained about uh, the detectors. And as I said, the detectors for radio astronomy came as an offshoot from the developments in radio communication technology in 1930s when man learned how to generate and receive long distance transmission of radio waves for communication purposes. And as often happens uh, in astronomy, uh, the discovery of radio signals from celestial objects was a completely serendipitous uh, discovery. Uh, and uh, this is something that we see in, in astronomy very often. And so it happened in Bell Labs where uh, the team was given the job of debugging a transatlantic communication system, which is picking up uh, unwanted noise uh, in, in the equipment. And uh, this person, Carl Jansky, uh, who was an engineer working in Bell Labs, was given the task of finding out uh, what was malfunctioning in the equipment or where was the unwanted signal coming from. And so he built this uh, apparatus, uh, which, believe it or not, was the first radio telescope of the world though modern radio telescopes look quite different from, from this. Uh, but he built this, and uh, as you can see, it's mounted on a rotating platform, which can go around uh, and therefore point in different directions uh, around uh, to see if there is interference signals coming from somewhere. And what Karl Jansky found is that the unwanted signals were not coming from any object on the surface of the Earth, but they appear to be coming from a fixed direction in the sky as uh, can be seen in this very simple plot that he made of the variation of the strength of the signal as the direction in which uh, the telescope was uh, looking. And uh, this soon led uh, to the understanding that there are many interesting objects in the universe which are radiating at radio frequencies and radio astronomy was born. Initially, it was pioneered by radio engineers because they are the ones who understood the technique of how to build a radio uh, telescope, a detector. And one of the uh, true pioneers was Grote Reber, who was again an engineer working in Bell Labs. And in his spare time, he built this antenna in his backyard, which looks a bit more like what we uh, imagine when we think of a radio antenna. And using this apparatus, he made the first uh, map of the radio sky, which is what you see uh, over here on the top left, where he was able to mark out the brightest sources of rad radio radiation that his telescope would pick up. And as you can see, they fall in a band which delineates the plane of the Milky Way. And uh, bright objects within the galaxy is the ones uh, that he primarily picked up, including towards the center of the galaxy, Sagittarius. And, uh, but there are, there, there, there are a few strong extragalactic radio sources also that he was able to pick up. And so from there, we have moved on a long way uh, in the growth of radio astronomy. So what we will look uh, now in part two is 
some basic ideas of how a radio telescope works, um, how it functions, what are the important concepts and what are the various um, technologies that are used in building a radio astronomy observatory. So, uh, in a very basic sense, a radio telescope is no different from your favorite satellite dish with which you receive um, your TV channels, um, but there is an important um, difference, uh, which is the fact that unlike the man-made signals which the satellite is sending down to your satellite receiver dish, the celestial signals that we are trying to detect are very weak. And, uh, in addition to that, uh, there is corruption of the signal due to noise that is uh, picked up uh, by uh, the electronics uh, of the receiver system as well as from the environment. But just to understand how weak the signals are, um, radio astronomers use this unit called the Jansky uh, in honor of Carl Jansky, which is 10 to the minus 26 watts per square meter per hertz of uh, incident uh, intensity of uh, the wave. And as you can see, that is a very small amount of power. And if you were to try and understand that in different ways, uh, you could do it. Uh, if you understand a bit of electrical engineering, then if you were to use a typical telescope uh, with uh, say of the order of a thousand square meter collecting area and a reasonable bandwidth uh, and ask how much power you are getting. It is a very small power, it is minus 100 dBm, where 0 dBm represents 1 milliwatt of power. So, you can see it is a very weak signal. Equivalently, uh, if you are more uh, physics, uh, physics inclined, then if you were to calculate the total energy that a typical uh, radio telescope would collect in a thousand years of continuous operation, it is 1 millijoule and that again is a very tiny amount of energy. So, that is just to drive home the point that the signals are very, very weak and uh, when that happens, you have to take a lot of care in picking up the signal from the antenna and processing it, amplifying it to the level where it can be conveniently uh, detected or recorded. Um, the second thing that you have to be careful is that any corrupting signal whether coming from uh, within the electronics as we all know that every piece of electronics uh, generates some intrinsic noise and if that noise overwhelms uh, the strength of the signal that we are receiving, then it becomes very difficult to detect that signal. Uh, in addition to intrinsic noise, uh, you can get corruption from ambient signals, man-made uh, signals, man-made interference. So, one has to be very careful when designing a radio telescope so as to minimize the noise and there are ways in which the intrinsic noise can be minimized by building the electronics uh, with special devices which uh, minimize uh, the noise including cooling of uh, the most critical parts of the receiver system to low temperatures to reduce uh, the noise from the electronics. So, finally, what happens in order to get the high sensitivity so that you can see faint sources out to distant reaches in the universe, uh, one needs to build large dishes uh, so that you can get as large as square meter of collecting area um, and one needs to build high quality low noise electronics to minimize the corruption due to noise. The other thing that helps of course is that as you can see this is uh, per hertz and so if you uh, have a naturally emitting radio source which is emitting over a very large bandwidth, then if you can receive the signal over that large bandwidth in the radio receiver, then again you can increase the amount of uh, power that you are getting from the source. So, of course, this works for sources whose natural bandwidth of emission is quite large. Uh, it will not work for sources which emit spectral lines, for example. Finally, uh, you can improve the final signal to noise of your detection by integrating uh, the received signal over a long duration of time. And that is because any noise that comes along with the signal 
uh, uh, only grows as the square root of the time of integration, whereas the strength of the signal increases linearly with the time of integration. So you can improve the signal to noise by uh, observing the so source for long durations and this is often done in, in radio astronomy. And we will see that it is also done for another reason when we come to the next issue uh, which is about the, uh, the resolution. But before we go to resolution, uh, we can have a quick look at the different types of radio antennas uh, that are used and to some extent the kind of antenna that you use varies depending on uh, the frequency or the wavelength at which one is working. So for example, at very long wavelengths, longer than a meter or so, uh, one prefers to use wire antennas such as dipoles and yagis, uh, the kind that are shown on the right here. And as you go to uh, shorter wavelengths, uh, less than a meter, uh, then the dish antenna, which is the more traditional kind of radio telescope, is the preferred model on preferred design and in between there are hybrid antennas where one uses wire reflectors and reflectors with dipole feeds uh, which work well when you have intermediate wavelengths which are say of the order of a meter or so which is around a few hundred megahertz of frequency. So when characterizing an antenna there are a few basic features or parameters uh, which one needs to understand and uh, therefore control in order to get an antenna with optimal performance. And this is illustrated uh, in this uh, uh, figure here where you can see that the basic thing is of course the primary reflector uh, with uh, either a sub reflector which brings the signal to a focus uh, down below here or uh, you can have a primary feed where you pick up the signal right at the primary focus and again we will see examples of that uh, in a minute. Uh, the antenna of course then needs to be on a mount uh, which can rotate in two primary axes usually, uh, the azimuth axis which allows you to move the antenna in the azimuth direction and the elevation axis which allows you to move the antenna in elevation up and down so that you can point at different directions in the sky and of course the ability to track uh, the source as the earth rotates. Now when you do this, uh, effectively the antenna uh, has the property that it is characterized by what we call a primary or a main beam uh, which basically represents the angular pattern of the response of the antenna much like the airy uh, pattern that one is familiar in optical astronomy which basically tells you that as a function of angle. Uh, around the direction in which the antenna is pointing, uh, what is the response of the antenna to uh, wave fronts coming from uh, the particular directions. And normally the antenna will have a main beam and this main beam is directly related to the resolution. Uh, so the, the angle of this main beam uh, goes exactly as the lambda by d, uh, the resolution. and um, and you can see the connection that uh, the wider the main beam, the poorer will be the ability of the antenna to resolve two objects which lie within the main beam in angular separation. And therefore, in order to have an antenna with better resolution, you want to uh, reduce the size of the main beam which means either you have a larger aperture or you have a smaller wavelength. Uh, but in addition to that, the antenna can have low level of response in angles which are very far away or relatively far away from the main direction in which the antenna is pointed and these are called side lobes and one again has to worry about them because if you are trying to observe source in a given direction, you do not want the antenna to be confused by picking up signals from a source which is at some relatively far away uh, angular position in the sky but uh, whose signal is picked up by the much weaker uh, side lobe response of the antenna. So the design often tries to minimize uh, the amplitude of these side lobes uh, so that most of the signal is picked up by the antenna uh, from the main lobe. Uh, so all of this goes into the sophistication of uh, the design of the electromagnetics um, of the antenna system uh, which we will not have time to go into the details. but. Uh, certainly, we can appreciate the fact that the reflector types and the feed arrangement uh, can be of uh, different configurations. 
ranging from the very basic simple prime focus one where you put the element that converts the electromagnetic field of the incoming radiation into a electrical voltage or electrical current uh, which we call a feed element right here at the focus uh, which is uh, relatively easy to do but it has its pros and cons. Uh, alternatively you can put a secondary reflector uh, at the focus in a Cassegrain arrangement whereby you pick up the final signal uh, down below it can even be below the main reflector. Uh, and then there are various variants uh, such as an offset Cassegrain, an azimuth and more complicated beam, uh, beam wave guide structures and what is called an offset parabola where uh, the parabolic section is such that uh, you cut it off from the full parabola and take only one half and use that and uh, bring the signal to a focus in a Cassegrain fashion. Uh, and you can ask what is the advantage of doing something like this compared to the Cassegrain or the prime focus and that is what is called blockage. So if you have something which is uh, above the reflector then it blocks some of the incoming uh, radiation, the plane wave coming in uh, and you uh, lose a little bit of the sensitivity and you also get uh, some amount of corruption of the beam shape or distortion of the beam shape because uh, there is a non-uniform illumination uh, by the incoming uh, electromagnetic uh, wavefront. Whereas in an offset situation you avoid that and you have an uninterrupted uh, unblocked aperture and uh, uh, but then you know this is obviously a harder mechanical arrangement to build and support because it is inherently asymmetric in its arrangement and the mechanical support structure uh, tends to be more cumbersome. And uh, here are actual real examples of antennas which follow these different ideas. So our own GMRT antenna is a prime focus uh, and then the uh, other examples of telescopes around the world with uh, the different arrangements and uh, here is an example of the offset uh, parabola. And all of these are built and used and as I said they have their pros and cons depending on uh, what is the prime goal and uh, how expensive uh, you can afford to make your telescope. And uh, the question of complexity and expense also comes in when we talk about the surface of uh, the reflector and uh, how accurate it needs to be. And uh, that again depends on the wavelength of the operation and uh, as you all would know if you have a, a reflector then it acts as an ideal reflector for a wavelength lambda if the surface is accurate to some fraction of lambda and as a thumb rule it is lambda by 10, it can be uh, say lambda by 20 and so if you have uh, a wavelength which is long enough then you can actually make the reflecting surface uh, from a mesh rather than from a solid um, as is shown in the left side with the GMRT antenna where it appears to be a transparent uh, reflecting surface but actually it is not transparent there is a fine mesh here uh, as compared to the antenna on the right which is a high frequency antenna which is a completely solid uh, metal panels uh, which make up the parabolic reflecting surface. And um, uh, obviously there are differences, uh, the antenna with a mesh uh, will be much lighter for the same size as compared to an antenna with a solid surface um, and therefore easier to build and uh, with a much lighter uh, support structure because the wind resistance uh, that is felt by a porous antenna with a mesh is much less than the wind resistance that you would feel when you have a solid panel uh, facing the wind and therefore when you have a higher force of the wind due to the solid panel you need a much heavier backup structure to support the antenna mm, and, and keep it stable and uh, that increases the weight of the antenna and then finally you have to move this antenna to drive it and the heavier the antenna the more uh, expensive and complicated is the drive train that is required in order to move the antenna, position it and track sources accurately in the sky. So as a result uh, we often find low frequency antennas have a different uh, design philosophy and a different uh, um, um, configuration and the way they are built as compared to high frequency antennas. And uh, uh, it 
uh, it makes a difference finally when one has to um, understand the larger effects, the bigger engineering problems and the cost to benefit ratio when you build uh, such antennas. And uh, as I said earlier that you need to mount this antenna to track sources and as we all know there are two popular kinds of mounts, uh, the equatorial mounting arrangement where you have one fixed axis and one rotating axis uh, where the polar axis needs to be aligned with the earth's um, the rotation axis which means this angle has to be equal to the latitude of the place and the altazimuth mount which is easier to build but has two axes and therefore uh, more complicated uh, uh, to operate. Now we move on from there to the other major point that we noted when we talked about the need for large radio telescopes which is the question of resolution. As we discussed earlier that both the sensitivity and the resolution depend on the size of the aperture and you can build a large aperture then you will get higher sensitivity and a better resolution. But then as you can imagine there would be practical limits to how large a uh, radio antenna you can build and still have it fully steerable. Uh, and some of the largest antennas that we have today which are fully steerable are of the order of 100 meters in diameter. An example shown here on the right is the 100 meter Green Bank radio telescope in the US. Um, 100 meters as you can imagine is quite large but if you ask what is the resolution that a 100 meter size radio telescope would provide then it is only half a degree at a 1 meter wavelength that is a 300 megahertz frequency and half a degree is very poor resolution compared to what even the simplest optical telescope would achieve simply because the wavelength at optical uh, is much much smaller than the wavelength at radio. And that is illustrated by the examples shown below here where we go back to the moon and the resolution on the moon as we saw even with the simple optical telescope you can start seeing details of the various features on the moon. But if you were to use a 100 meter size radio telescope to look at the moon it would appear just like this blurred um, circular disk uh, without any ability to be able to resolve the features because that is about half a degree 30 arc minutes. And so that drives home the point that the major disadvantage that radio astronomy faces when it comes to resolution. And if you look at a galaxy uh, you will see a similar picture, uh, you would see image uh, detailed features of uh, Andromeda but if you were to look at it with this single dish of 100 meter size you may get an image which looks like this one where you can just barely make out any detail. Uh, so people do try to build larger uh, single dishes but uh, they are the ones which are fixed in the ground and cannot be moved and therefore cannot easily track over a large region of the sky. So this is an example of a 300 meter uh, Arecibo radio telescope which has been around for uh, several decades now and there is now one in China which is 500 meters in size but they are fixed in the ground and only the feed element here at the focus has some ability to be moved uh, so that you can get some limited uh, coverage in the sky. So they act like transit instruments but with some limited ability to look around in a uh, range of angles around the zenith uh, that the antenna is pointing to. So that is not very good and, uh, and this uh, major disadvantage of radio astronomy took a while before it was discovered that you can actually synthesize a telescope of large size as far as resolution is concerned by spreading out many smaller individual antennas over a large area. Uh, so as an example I have shown here an array antenna called the very large array telescope uh, located in the US where you can see lots of relatively small antennas. They are still of the order of uh, you know few tens of meters in size uh, but many of them and uh, spread out over distances which are of the order of uh, tens of kilometers um, in extent. And um, um, this idea that you can actually combine the signals from these antennas in a manner whereby you can recover um, an image with a resolution which is effectively what you would have got if you had built a single dish whose diameter was equal to the area over which the individual antennas are spread out. 
And this technique uh, is called aperture synthesis because uh, you're basically synthesizing a larger aperture by using many, many smaller apertures. And the word earth rotation comes in front of it because I'll, I'll explain in a moment how aperture synthesis works and then we will appreciate what role the earth rotation plays in it. Uh, but as I said, this allows you to replace lambda by d by lambda by ds, where ds is the largest separation between the antennas. So this basically allows radio astronomy to overcome this major challenge of poor resolution uh, without having to build these uh, very large uh, single dishes which are impractical beyond a certain size uh, by building smaller antennas, spreading them out over a larger distance uh, and then combining the signal from them in the appropriate manner, uh, which brings its own challenges. And uh, to do that, we need to understand how the technique works. And uh, effectively, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Young's double slit, uh, each pair of antennas effectively acts like a double slit. Uh, what that means is that uh, when you combine the signals from a pair of antennas by co correlating them, in what is called a correlator to get the cross spectrum, you are effectively picking up one sinusoidal oscillation uh, on the sky plane. Effectively, you are measuring one Fourier component of uh, the spatial distribution of intensity on the sky. And it's a two-dimensional spatial intensity distribution. Any image in the sky can be considered as a two-dimensional image. And if you were to decompose the two-dimensional image, into a two-dimensional Fourier transform with these Fourier components, then you can show mathematically that a pair of antennas, when the signal from those is combined in this manner, is actually responding to or picking up the Fourier component whose Fourier frequency depends on the wavelength and the vector separation between the antennas. And now you can see that if you had many of these antennas, then if you were to combine the signals from the antennas pairwise, then you would be able to synthesize the different Fourier components of the image in the Fourier plane. And if you have enough of them, then you can actually solve the problem of taking the inverse two-dimensional Fourier transform of that data to reconstruct the two-dimensional intensity distribution in the sky. And uh, this is the basis of uh, the technique called aperture synthesis. The important point here is to note that the, it is the vector separation between the antenna uh, as seen by the source that's important. And as you can imagine, if you had uh, two antennas which were east-west in their orientation, then as the earth rotates, uh, the effective uh, projected baseline that the source sees for an east-west antenna changes uh, as the source rises to the time it transits uh, to the time it sets. So the baseline appears foreshortened when the source is rising and when the source sets and when the source is vertically above, uh, it sees the full east-west baseline. So effectively from the same pair of antennas as a function of time from the time the source rises to the time the source sets, you can actually measure different Fourier components of the image and that is why uh, the earth rotation is an important part of the aperture synthesis technique and that is why you often end up observing the source over a long track from the time it rises to the time it sets using this array of antennas and so that you can uh, reconstruct as many Fourier components as is possible. Of course, as you can see here, there is a fairly uh, complicated signal processing that needs to be carried out in order to do this calculation and this has, some of this has to be done in real time in order to be able to keep up with the rate at which the data is coming. And once you integrate the data after correlating it for some time, then you can actually record it and do the rest of the processing offline to make the final two-dimensional inverse Fourier transform and the image. So this is, it gives you a basic idea of how this is done. And, and then let's look at some examples of what it achieves. So this is an example of a radio image of a particular object called the Cygnus A, which is a radio galaxy. Uh, made uh, with the uh, best image made before the VLA uh, instrument which I showed a short while ago was built 
and you can see that there is a uh, object here with the radiation from the center and radiation from these two lobes of the radio galaxy. But this is an image uh, of the same object made with this VLA array and uh, uh, the, this is of course um, different in the sense that this is a false color grayscale image compared to the top one which is a contour image. But nevertheless, uh, the point is very clear that you can see much better detail in the lower image. That means this has a much higher resolution. You can make out that the object at the center is a very small compact object. You can make out a jet of radio emission from the central core of the object to the lobes of the radio galaxy and you can see much more detailed structure uh, in, the in the lobes of the radio galaxy. So this just illustrates uh, the view that uh, these large aperture instruments provide in uh, radio astronomy. Uh, you can of course ask that how far can you extend this concept of array telescopes? Can you do this beyond few tens of kilometers is, which is what I was showing? And yes, in principle, as you can imagine, uh, you should be able to do it with antennas which are spread out over an entire continent. Uh, and then you would get extremely high resolution of the order of milli arc seconds, which would even start doing better than some of the optical telescopes where, uh, you know, you are often limited to an arc second of seeing in ground based optical telescopes. Uh, you would of course ask that how would you get the data together and do the signal processing and that is what uh, would be a technological challenge in this which is uh, initially in the early days it was overcome by being able to record the raw voltages at high speeds uh, on local recording machines, especially designed recording systems and then transporting those uh, tapes as they were in the early days to a common place where the data was read and the signal processing relating to the correlation was carried out. And uh, you can then even extend this uh, to intercontinental long baseline interferometry where you do this with antennas spread out uh, between continents and again that is practical, it is possible to do that and today the fact that you have optical fibers connecting pretty much every place on the earth allow you to carry these signals in quasi real time from the antennas to the central processing place where you can carry out the processing and make the images. You can of course extend this to one level higher and ask can I do this with antennas on the earth and antennas in space and yes, uh, this is again as you can imagine is conceptually possible. It is a thought experiment that you could easily think of, uh, but to convert it into reality uh, is a bit more challenging, but it has been done. So you can actually send antennas, uh, radio antennas on uh, space probes and uh, reach to a certain location above the earth, unfurl them, make a proper reflecting surface and then uh, be able to observe the same source with this antenna as with ground based antennas, uh, record the data at the places and then transmit the data from the space based antenna to the ground uh, with the regular uh, space communication equipment and then correlate the data. Uh, between the ground based antennas, base based antennas to get now effective baselines which are you know uh, several tens of thousands of kilometers and uh, therefore very high resolution. This is an example of the kind of study where uh, the very central uh, region of a quasar uh, can be resolved in radio wavelengths uh, to show that uh, there is very fine structure uh, at milli arc seconds and uh, finer scales. Uh, that can be detected. And so uh, this has been used uh, now uh, quite effectively for very specialized kinds of uh, studies in radio astronomy and it tells you, you know, as to, you know, how far you can go today with uh, this technique. So with that we will move on to uh, the case study of uh, an overall radio telescope or observatory and we will take our own GMRT as an example. So the giant meter wave radio telescope is a world class radio facility which is built by NCR ATIFR and uh, uh, built during the 1990s and operational since 2002. Uh, it is specialized for low frequency applications uh, typically in the range from 50 to 1450 megahertz which is towards the lower part of that large radio window that I showed earlier and it is an array telescope consists of 30 antennas. Each of them is fairly large in its own right, 45 meters in diameter and uh, it is one of the largest facilities at these frequencies in the world today. 
and um, a bit like the VLA array that I showed you, the antennas are roughly in a Y-shaped structure on the large scale uh, with a set of antennas in a compact configuration in the center, uh, which, uh, which we call the central square, one kilometer by one kilometer region with 12 antennas and the remaining 18 spread out in a Y-shaped arrangement going out to uh, largest distance from the center, which is a bit over 14 kilometers, and thereby allowing you to synthesize an antenna as far as resolution is concerned, whose area is equivalent to that of a 28 kilometer size dish. And uh, uh, this works quite well. And here are some pictures. Here's a <coughs> Google view of the central square, uh, one kilometer by one kilometer region, showing you uh, these specs, which are the individual antennas. Here's a zoomed in view, where you can start making out the individual antennas. These are the three of the closest antennas, which provide the shortest baselines in the Fourier synthesis. And uh, this is the central building where the signals from all the antennas are brought over optical fiber and then the signal processing that I described earlier is carried out in digital processing systems over here. And the control room from whereby the entire array is controlled is located uh, right here. This is a view from the nearby hills showing the central square antennas. Uh, this is a close up of a single antenna. As I said, 45 meters in diameter, a pretty large structure and it is a prime focus instrument. So, you can see the main feed elements which pick up the radio waves, convert them to electrical signals located at the focus. And this is the kind of crane that is needed in order to be able to access and work at the focus of the antenna in order to uh, either replace electronics, put new things, maintenance and so on. And so, as you can see, it's a fairly challenging task. Uh, and you can imagine building such a large structure is equally challenging. This shows a um, sequence of how a single antenna was built. The tower on which it sits is a three-story high tower and then the structure is assembled on top of it. The antenna itself is built on the ground and then lifted up, hoisted up on these four cranes uh, to the top and then bolted in place to get the final working system. As you can see, it's a mechanical challenge. Not just mechanical, there are many subsystems that make up uh, such an instrument uh, which all uh, technologies that one needs to master in order to uh, have a, a good quality observatory, ranging from the mechanical subsystems, the servo systems which are important for accurate positioning and movement of the antenna on the two axes, then the electromagnetics, the antenna feeds uh, which you put at the focus. Uh, here you uh, can put feeds of four different kinds at the focus and uh, there is a rotating turret here at the focus which can rotate and bring the desired feed to the focus that is pointing to the dish so that it can pick up the reflected signals. And uh, then the signal, the voltage signal that you pick up is, as I said, very faint. It has to be properly conditioned, amplified, uh, brought down to the bottom. So there is electronics right at the top, uh, which is the most crucial electronics, which does the initial amplification and conditioning of the signal is brought down over cables to the bottom of the dish where there is further conditioning and then it is transmitted over optical fiber. So, there is a lot of optical fiber technology in order to send it to the central receiver and then it is digitized there and uh, then the rest of the signal processing is carried out. And in order to control all of this, there is a very sophisticated monitor control and telemetry system because everything is controlled from the central facility in an automatic fashion, whereby you can run an entire chain of observations for several hours, if not many days, uh, from the central control room. And so there's um, uh, fairly sophisticated uh, software for doing all of that. And finally, uh, software for the offline processing, which allows you to take these Fourier components and do the imaging process to, to make the final radio image of the sky, which again has uh, fairly sophisticated um, uh, issues that one needs to understand and overcome, including how do you calibrate the data and so on. So, this is just a very simple block diagram flowchart of the receiver system, starting from the feed element at the antenna focus uh, to the front end electronics at the focus to the antenna base receiver system, the fiber optical transmitter. Uh, and the transmission on optical fiber 
to the central station where it is received and uh, an analog processing chain and a digital processing chain uh, all with their proper control for setting the frequencies and selecting the frequencies correctly and, and so on. So, the original GMRT system had a bandwidth of 32 megahertz. If you remember in the f uh, when we talked earlier that the larger the bandwidth that you can build for your receiver system, the more signal you can collect and therefore, the higher the sensitivity for observing sources which emit over a large range of frequencies. Uh, and so, the original GMRT was designed for 32 megahertz of bandwidth which is uh, reasonable, but uh, uh, by today's standard fairly modest and we will we'll see that in a minute. And uh, it can also process signals for observing pulsars which are compact radio sources uh, which require a slightly different signal processing than is needed for making the images of larger objects such as nebulae and galaxies. Okay, so, the GMRT as I said was you know built in the 1990s and it was uh, dedicated as an international facility uh, from late 2001 onwards and 2002 onwards uh, regular observations uh, started with the GMRT and people from all over the world use the facility as you can see here uh, with a healthy participation about 50 percent of the proposals from India and others from um, astronomers from uh, literally all over the world. It is a highly uh, oversubscribed instrument in the sense that the demand is uh, always a factor of 2 to 3 higher than uh, the amount of time that we have available for scheduling observations and uh, which means that the process for getting time on the telescope is fairly competitive in terms of the best proposals with the best ideas and that get time. And a typical radio facility like the GMRT uh, is used for a very broad range of science topics uh, which are listed here uh, all the way from studying uh, the details of the radio emission from the sun and its properties to even looking for extrasolar planets and then studying objects like pulsars and galactic objects like supernova remnants, microquasars, um, explosive transients like gamma ray bursts, uh, then different uh, forms of new hydrogen gas ionized or neutral uh, both in our galaxy and in other galaxies and uh, radio properties of different kinds of galaxies studying clusters of galaxies and what are called radio galaxies which are galaxies which emit preferentially uh, strongly in radio frequencies like the example that I showed you when I was illustrating the power of the resolution uh, that is a typical radio galaxy and uh, further beyond that cosmology the epoch of reionization and uh, other topics. Uh, the other kind of um, study that a uh, large facility uh, like the GMRT is often used for are what are called all sky surveys. So, you can carry out a uniform survey of uh, the entire sky visible from the observatory and make uh, images of the entire sky. It is like an atlas of the universe, uh, but at that at particular frequency. In this case, the GMRT has been used to make a very sensitive all sky survey called the TGSS at 150 megahertz, which was not available uh, for astronomers before that at that frequency with that kind of resolution and sensitivity. And that gives you again a very complementary view of uh, compared to a similar atlas made at a higher frequency and you can then look for sources which are common, which are not common. You can study the same source over a wide range of frequencies. You can do uh, various kinds of statistical studies about the distribution of sources in the sky and uh, lots of uh, new ideas can come by studying uh, the objects or results produced from such surveys. And many new results have been uh, published using the GMRT. And uh, what we have done now recently is to complete a major upgrade of the GMRT to improve its sensitivity by more than a factor of 2 and also make it a much more versatile instrument uh, which will keep it on the forefront in the global scenario for the next decade or so. And so, the main feature in the upgraded GMRT is to provide nearly seamless frequency coverage from 120 to 1450 megahertz which we are likely to extend down to 50 megahertz and uh, improve the instantaneous bandwidth to 400 megahertz from 32 megahertz uh, and uh, also have uh, improved quality of the receivers with higher sensitivity and better rejection of the unwanted man-made radio 
noise that uh, is often present. And this is an example showing the improvement in the frequency coverage. So, the small white boxes show the frequency coverage that the old GMRT system offered uh, in this range of frequencies from about 100 megahertz to about uh, uh, almost 1500 megahertz. And the purple boxes show the improved frequency coverage which is now available and the y axis shows what is called the fractional bandwidth that means there is one observing band from uh, this uh, frequency to this one which has a, a large fractional bandwidth compared to the center frequency and um, the fractional bandwidth of course decreases as you go to the higher frequencies uh, where the bandwidth though it goes up is still the maximum is around 400 to 450 megahertz. And the gaps here uh, which you would wonder why uh, some gaps have been left, these are places where there is very strong man-made transmissions uh, which are so strong that it is impossible to operate the radio antennas in those regions, uh, uh, they, uh, the signal is completely corrupted. So, these are uh, TV transmissions, mobile phone transmissions which uh, we uh, avoid but try to cover the rest of the frequency space which is available. And this is an example of the improvement in the performance that uh, the upgraded GMRT offers compared to the legacy system. Uh, where the legacy system sensitivity for uh, what is the best quality image that you can get from a 9 hour long aperture synthesis observation of a typical source um, improves. That means, you can get better sensitivity, uh, lower uh, value in Janskys, it is in micro Janskys here that you can measure and uh, going from the blue fill circles to the purple fill circles is the improvement in going from the legacy GMRT system to the upgraded system. And what it also shows is the uh, sensitivities that the other facilities in the world are currently operating or expected to come online in the near future. And you can see that compared to most of the other facilities, uh, the GMR upgraded GMRT is expected to perform quite favorably until you come to these symbols with the stars which is the square kilometer array. Uh, which we will talk about in a short while, which is still a project which is still in the design and planning phases. But the basic improvement that the upgraded GMRT provides is by a factor of 3, mostly a combination of the larger bandwidth and uh, the better quality receivers with uh, lower noise. Okay, so that brings us to the last part which is to look ahead to the future and ask the question that what lies uh, ahead in the realm of radio astronomy. And uh, as we saw, whether it is the upgraded GMRT or even plans that we have for further enhancing and expanding the GMRT, there are other plans and other facilities that are uh, coming up. The LOFAR is a low frequency array in Europe, which is uh, actually now under operation and is producing results. ALMA is International Millimeter Wave Radio Telescope, which is again also now producing results in Chile. And uh, there is now the thing that the radio astronomy community is really looking forward to is a square kilometer array, which is currently in the design phase. And so, we will talk a little bit about what is the SKA and what does it promise. So, this is the most ambitious radio astronomy project ever attempted. And to understand that is a plot here, which shows as a function of time, that is over the years since the time Groot Reber, uh, whom we talked about earlier, built his first radio telescope back in the 1940s to how the sensitivity of radio telescopes has improved over the years. And somewhere here you see the GMRT at the time when it was uh, conceptualized uh, and then built uh, and the uh, upgraded GMRT would fall again on this line somewhere over here. Uh, but what the SK aims to do is more than a factor of 10 better than any of these existing facilities. And that is something that uh, is expected to be 30 to 50 times better than the world's best radio telescope uh, with a total collecting area of 1 square kilometer which is the where gives the name the square kilometer array which is 30 times the collecting area of the GMRT. But it will have many more antennas than just 30 times the 30 antennas of the GMRT because the antennas for the SKA will be smaller in size than the 45 meter diameter dishes of GMRT so that they can see a larger field of view at a given time. And it will have a much higher resolution because it will have antennas spread out in the final configuration up to thousands of kilometers, 
but connected in real time by optical fiber and a much wider range of frequency coverage from tens of megahertz to 10 gigahertz or so and located in very radio quiet regions of the world, uh, semi-desert regions in Australia and South Africa far away from man-made sources of noise and uh, will have cutting edge science applications. So, it will sit right up there along with all the next generation mega facilities, uh, the optical facilities such as the uh, TMT and the GMT, the ALMA that we already talked about and the next generation space optical space telescopes of James Webb and the gravitational wave detectors like the LIGO and it is important and heartening to note that uh, out of these India is participating in at least three of these uh, large international projects that are shown here, uh, the optical, LIGO and the radio. And so, as you can imagine a telescope of the kind of specifications uh, that the SKA is designed for requires cutting edge technologies in various areas, whether it is the design of the receptors themselves, there is the design of the electronics the optical fiber signal transport system where the total network traffic will be larger than the total global internet traffic that we see today and uh, state of the art uh, signal processing and uh, supercomputing uh, requirements for being able to analyze the data and make images and a very complicated management structure to manage these far flung spread out antennas operating from two different continents and uh, so there is a lot of technology development that is required in order to make the SKA happen and uh, since SKA itself is very challenging, it is split into two phases. Phase 1 is just 10 percent of the final specification of the SKA which is still a fairly sophisticated instrument can be used for many uh, cutting edge science applications and it is to be built with a slightly limited frequency range and a smaller extent uh, in area as compared to the final array. Uh, but built to keep all the infrastructure and design ideas so that it can be expanded to the full SKA later on. And the two sites that I mentioned with the global headquarters uh, in the UK. So, truly a multinational project with 10 different countries that are taking part in this. And uh, as I said currently in the design phase which should uh, complete by the end of 2019 and to be built from 2020 to 2025 at a fairly large cost as shown here with different countries contributing to it and here is a pictorial representation of what the array would look like in South Africa which would be the mid frequency array using these dishes but these are the offset paraboloid dishes that we talked about in the beginning different from the prime focus dishes that the GMRT uses and uh, that is a completely unblocked aperture and located in a semi desert region in the northern part of South Africa and extending from there outwards. Uh, to larger distances and the low frequency part of the SKA working from around 50 to 350 megahertz a very different design using dipoles which is what I mentioned in the earlier part that at very low frequencies one tends to move away from dishes and uses fields of dipoles where a field of many uh, thousand dipoles like this would effectively uh, act like a single antenna or a station is what it is called. Again, a lot of sophisticated signal processing to combine the signals from each of these dipoles in order to uh, make it look like a single station and then many such stations just like you would have many antennas spread out over a large region and again located in a semi desert region in Western Australia far away from the nearest cities. And uh, the partnership which is a global, global partnership with many different countries. Uh, working together right now, more who are interested and may join in the near future and um, work which is coordinated from the central project office located in uh, the UK. And uh, when you talk about the kind of science that is possible with SK, it is truly transformational and I have listed here the different topics which range all the way from the very early universe, the cosmic dawn, the epoch of reionization to cosmology, dark energy, evolution of galaxies uh, from their study of the radio continuum emission uh, of and the neutral hydrogen emission and the origin and evolution of cosmic magnetism, transient radio sources, uh, fast radio bursts uh, and various uh, such phenomena. Very interesting tests of strong field test of gravity using pulsars 
and black holes, which are envisaged to be feasible with the square kilometer array. Uh, even topics uh, which border on astrobiology, detecting protoplanetary disks, searching for complex molecules, which can be the building blocks of life, to even searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, what we call SETI, which is uh, uh, one of the very interesting areas that uh, radio astronomy uh, pursues. Uh, have not had a successful detection yet, but that would happen any time. Uh, that would be a great discovery. And finally, when you build any facility which is 10 times better than anything else that exists, uh, astronomy always throws up the unexpected discoveries, what is called serendipitous signs, because there is always new things out there in the universe which we do not know about. And the moment you have better abilities to see the universe, you start seeing the new uh, features. So, uh, with that um, look at the future of radio astronomy, I will end with a very quick and very brief summary uh, that radio astronomy is the study of the universe through the fairly wide radio window in the electromagnetic spectrum. It is one of the two windows that is accessible with ground based telescopes and therefore much easier to do than the other windows where you have to build telescopes which have to be flown on uh, space missions to get above the limitations of the earth's environment. And therefore, radio telescopes can be large uh, dishes, um, but as we saw that there are limitations even to the largest radio antennas that you can build and uh, the radio astronomy has moved to the concept of having arrays of antennas spread out over large distances in order to achieve the sufficiently high resolution that you uh, aim for. And as we saw, uh, this can go not just to baselines or antenna distances which are of the order of, of you know what could fit in a country, but what could fit in a continent and even between earth and space space antennas to get some of the highest resolutions. And as we saw very briefly that many kinds of sophisticated engineering and technology are needed for building a modern radio astronomy observatory and making it fully functional to get the best out of it. And an example that we looked at was our own giant meter wave radio telescope, uh, which is a facility that uh, runs in India and has produced many interesting results in the last several years and is being upgraded to improve its sensitivity and to make it a more versatile facility and keep it uh, in the forefront of global radio astronomy for the next uh, several years to come. In the longer term, we looked at what may be the future of radio astronomy, which is large multinational projects like the Square Kilometer Array, where all nations coming together to build a truly large scale facility at the best possible sites uh, on the surface of the earth. And uh, the SKA promises revolutionary science, uh, but requires next generation cutting edge technology in order to implement it. And uh, the design work for that is currently ongoing, expected to be finished by next year to 2019 and construction expected to start from 2020 and uh, facility available for use from around 2024 or so. And uh, that truly would be a revolutionary facility which uh, astronomers from all over the world are very much looking forward to. So, with that we come to the end of this lecture and I hope that has uh, helped you to get a good basic understanding of radio astronomy and the facilities that uh, we use and how we build them and what kind of uh, technology goes into them and what kind of uh, results and capabilities are possible with them. Thank you.